So we've been doing this series called A Responsive Life. And so as Christians, as followers of Jesus, remember that uh, our, our, uh, part of our calling as Christians is to be living a, a countercultural life. So living life, living our lives with a different character uh, in a way that's counter to the rest of the culture. And so what we witness in the rest of the culture is uh, people's reactiveness, their aggressiveness, their defensiveness, and sometimes their passiveness. Uh, what we want to be is responsive. That is to say, we want to keep ourselves in the flow and in the move of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit moves, we move with Him. The Holy Spirit uh, uh, walks and, and we walk with Him. So we're keeping ourselves responsive uh, to God, responsive to the Holy Spirit, not living reactive, defensive, aggressive, or passive lives, or even passive-aggressive lives. So um, uh, we, answer these, we answer these five questions. So the questions that we're going to deal with today is, um, uh, have you recently had a faith conversation with someone, either about your faith or theirs? Have you recently had a faith conversation with someone, either about your faith or theirs? And so we're going to talk about being responsive to the harvest, and for that, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to 38. So if you have your Bibles, uh, be good to go there. I'll have you highlight some things. Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to 38. And it'll be on the screen as well, uh, but it's really the best uh, to look at in your Bible so you can have it there and you can mark certain things. So here we go. Are you ready, John? There we go. All right. So starting in verse 35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogue, and preaching the good news of the kingdom. Underline, highlight, good news of the kingdom. This is one of the things that we need to be mindful of, of what we possess. This, Paul calls it this treasure in jars of clay, that we have good news, and the good news is about a kingdom. A good news, the good news is about a kingdom. So, like, we look at the world today, and we think, what, what, what a mess, right? What a mess the world is in. Uh, right it is. It, like ev Everything's going wrong. And Jesus comes preaching this good news of the kingdom of God to say that everything that's gone wrong with the world, he is going to return as king and put the world to rights. Return as king. It's the good news of a kingdom. So the kingdom of God is coming. And in fact, he says there's evidence of its presence even now. Even now there's evidence of its presence. But it's coming in its fullness and he's going to put the world to rights. Imagine that. Imagine a world where everything that's gone wrong is put to rights. Where, where God has his way instead of humans having theirs. So that's good news. That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the, the good news that Jesus brought. Undoing, undoing uh, the things that had gone wrong. So he came preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, saw the, like, you know what? Highlight, circle, underline, saw the crowds. Jesus saw people. He saw people. I know we joke a lot about how uh, some of you like going out in the woods and being alone with God, and some of us like going to New York City and uh, seeing the crowds, seeing the crowds. So one of the things I like about places like New York City is that, uh, uh, that there are so many people. That's what I like about it. There are so many people. And, 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 and uh, these are people that Jesus loves. These are people that God loves. So uh, he saw the crowds. What I'm inviting you to do is, is not to run away from the crowds, but to move toward the crowds, to see the crowds uh, as Jesus did. He saw the crowds. Hey, and nothing's wrong with liking being out in the woods either. I didn't mean to insinuate otherwise. Okay, okay. Um, I should just read the text. He saw the crowds and he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest therefore to send out workers into the harvest field. So the harvest is another one of these instances where God initiates and we participate. 
God initiates and we participate. How? How does God initiate in the harvest and how do we participate in the harvest? Well, Paul says that God provides seed for the sower. So God gives us seed. That's the word of God. And, and we take the seed and we plant it. We take the seed and we scatter it. That's the parable of the sower, right? So we plant the seed. Paul says we plant the seed, we water the seed, we cultivate the seed, we harvest, but God gives the growth. So God gives the seed and God gives the growth, but we participate in the harvest by scattering the seed, by watering the seed, and then finally by bringing in the harvest. So this is... Um, uh, th this is how this works. Our, our calling as Christians, like the, this, this life we live as Christians, and if you look on the inside of, um, if you look on the inside of your uh, bulletin, uh, you can see some message notes there. Now, sometimes I give you message notes and I just tell you everything. Sometimes I give you message notes and I actually ask you to fill in the blanks. Uh, this is one of those times where there's actually a lot of blanks to fill in, and I really think it's worthwhile. And filling them in uh, helps you to uh, 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 solidify uh, what, what's being said in the, in the message today. So, uh, our life with Jesus, if we're a follower of Jesus, our life with Jesus is a come and go proposition. Come and go. So, all, we're not looking at all of these verses, but all of these verses that there are listed, they're about either coming to Jesus or, or going from Jesus or being sent by Jesus. So, uh, uh, it's most succinctly said in Mark chapter 3, um, and so we're going to get that one on the screen, Mark chapter 3, and it says, um, I've got it here somewhere, uh, and Jesus appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, and, and this is what it says, he appointed 12, who he also named apostles, to be with him and to be sent out with the message. What, what message is that? The same message that Jesus gave. The message preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Called to be with him and to be sent out. To be with and to be sent out. So there was always this flowing in and going out. Flowing into Jesus and going out. When we worship together, we're, we're, we're acting out that same rhythm. We're coming together, we're coming to be together at the feet of Jesus, and then when we leave this place, we don't just leave, like I hope you notice, like every single Sunday when we pronounce the benediction, we're not just saying goodbye, we're sending out, right? So that's the way this ebb and flow goes, that's the pattern of this life with Jesus. He calls us to him, come to me all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, and then in that same gospel, Matthew uh, at, the end of, at the end of the book, he, 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 he sends us out. He sends us out. He says to uh, those very first disciples, follow me, all right, that's come, right? Follow me, and what? I will make you fishers of men. I'm, I'm going to send you out. Come to me, and I'm going to send you out. So this is the life that we live. Uh, we, we live this life not just weekly, but daily. Daily, we come to Jesus. We start the day with Jesus. And, and as soon as we go out the door, he's sending us out. Can we, can we have Matthew 28, uh, 19, John? Uh, Matthew 28, 19. Uh, so we know this is the Great Commission. And the words that we read in a typical translation are, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it continues on to say, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. Now, what's interesting uh, about the Great Commission is uh, 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 so we translate it to make it more typical English language, like we want it to sound um, uh, more like we speak. But the lead verb in, uh, in this verse is make disciples. Everything else modifies that. So the word go, uh, the more accurate way to translate it would be going, going. Therefore, going, make disciples of all nations, baptizing, teaching. Going, baptizing, teaching. That's, that's, that's the way it lines up. So it's in our going that we make disciples. And that, that's, our every, that's not, that's not our, our, our going to some mission field. That's in our everyday, ordinary going. 
going to work, going to school, going out. This is just the regular comings and goings of your daily life. And in your going, as, as all of us are going, we're going to meet people. We're going to see people. We're going to work with people. We're going to interact with people. And here's what's true about all of those people. God created them as his image. Now, it might be an image that's broken, an image that's marred, an image that's defaced, an image that's in need of repair, But you can be sure that if you're looking at a living, breathing person, God created that person. And he created that person to be his image, as his image. Secondly, you can be sure that that person you're looking at is someone that is loved by the Father. For God so loved the world. They're made by God, created in his image. They're loved by the Father, Everyone you look at is someone for whom Jesus died. Now, I'll I'll acknowledge the fact that there are branches of the Christian church that that don't believe that, that Jesus didn't die for everyone, but but we do, all right? We believe that Jesus died for for everyone. So you're never going to see a person for whom Jesus didn't die. And here's something else that we claim by faith, that The Holy Spirit is already at work in that person. Like you might be able to see it and they might not recognize it themselves, but the Holy Spirit is at work in that person. Okay, I said there are four things that are true. It's actually five. God created them. The Father loves them. Jesus died for them. The Holy Spirit's at work in them and they have an eternal destiny. They have an eternal destiny. They will either be with God in the eternal city where there's no need for sun because God gives it his light where there's a river that flows and the trees on both sides of that river bear its fruit every month where all the goodness of everything that God made that God made is brought in. It's either in the eternal city or, or, or they will be outside. Uh, as the book of Revelation depicts them, they're, they're outside the city gates separated from God. When Jesus saw the crowd, he had compassion. He had compassion on them. Everyone we see, created in God's image, the Father loves, Jesus died for, the Holy Spirit's working in, and they have an eternal destiny. And so we, as we look at those people, we have compassion on them. We see the crowd's we have compassion. You know, uh, a, a, a lot of years ago, and this is how I know how many years ago it was, does anybody in the building remember when we had a screen right in the middle? So uh, we had a very weak projector, and uh, uh, we had a very big screen. It was like twice as big as these screens. Well, so way back that far, uh, I wanted to say st- Something about this same order. I wanted to, I wanted to talk to the folks about how um, everybody they see every day, everywhere they go, uh, they're going to see somebody God loves. And I, I wanted to prove it to them. So I had this, what I thought was a really clever idea. Uh, I thought it was such a clever idea that I thought, I thought God gave me this idea that uh, I was going to take my camera with me one day. And I was, everywhere I went... Uh, I was, whoever I saw, I was going to ask them, hey, can, can I take your picture? Uh, I'm a pastor, and, and this Sunday I'm going to talk about everywhere you go, you see people that God loves, and you're a person that God loves, so I, I want to take your picture so I can prove it to my congregation, which I thought was like a, a brilliant way just to be able to tell people that God loves them, you know? So, thanks, Jeanine. So, uh, right, so... Uh, Uh, I went to breakfast that morning at Perkins. Remember Perkins? I went to breakfast that morning at Perkins, and my waitress comes, and I tried this spiel on her. I said, you know, I'm a pastor, and this Sunday in church, I'm going to be preaching this message about how everywhere you go, you see people that God loves, and you're a person that God loves, 
And so I'd like to take your picture so I can show it to my church. What do you think? She said, oh, no. It's like, oh, you know, there's nothing worse than having a brilliant idea, and the very first time you throw it out there, you get turned away, right? And in my head, in my brain, I'm thinking, like, okay, God, this really wasn't the way it's supposed to work, right? So uh, I said, oh, uh, I'm sorry. And she said, you know, I just, I, I, I don't like having my picture taken alone. I said, oh, well, wh why don't you bring out your coworkers? And, and I did the same spiel with them, right? Uh, you know, this Sunday, I'm going to tell people. And so everywhere I went, I took pictures of people that God loves, which, which could have been anybody, right? And, and it was just anybody. Everywhere you go, be mindful. See the crowds. See the crowds. Have compassion on them. And so uh, we find our, if we see people in this way, and we believe that the Holy Spirit is, is working in these people's lives, moving in these people's lives already, uh, they may be open to having a conversation about faith, and not only open, but wanting to. So uh, how would that conversation go? Like, in a faith conversation, what, what do we talk about? Well, I want to say, uh, there, let me suggest three things. Uh, and you can write this down uh, so you don't forget. In a faith conversation, you talk about them. You talk about them. If you give people a chance, if you just give them a chance, you can learn a lot about them in, in, in a very short amount of time. Remember, uh, whatever you think about a person, like when, you, when you're watching a person or sizing a person up, whatever it is you think of them, they, they are the way they are for a reason. Like they have a history. And, and their history isn't brief. Their history isn't simple. Like there's something, there's something to their life. And so uh, as we let them talk about themselves, uh, we, we practice uh, this way of caring for somebody just by listening to them. Like, like always being ready to ask one more question. One more question. Don't be quick. To say, oh, yeah, I remember my own life, blah, 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 blah. You know, just ask, ask one more question about them. Hear from them. Care enough about them to let them share their story with you. Uh, it, it really is remarkable. Um, like I, I've found, and I think you would find too, uh, somebody cares and listens. Complete strangers share some of the most revealing details of their life in a very short order. Because they're not used to people really caring. They're not used to people really listening. So let them talk about them. And you'll discover things about them. And while they're talking, the likelihood is they might actually be discovering things about themselves. All right, so first you talk about them. That's the first thing. Secondly, uh, uh, we, we talk about Jesus. We talk about Jesus, which is really quite simple because uh, we generally like to talk about things we're excited about. We like to talk about things that we're excited about. I, um, uh, again, I'm, just, I'm, I'm really reminiscent about early years here at T-Free. Um, I took a ride to a ball game one time. We were going to the ball game as a church, and... Um, I was riding with uh, um, uh, George and Betty Lowther. Now, uh, some of you know uh, George and Betty from church. Some of you know George Lowther uh, in other contexts. Uh, so George was a, was a drywaller, and uh, uh, he, he was pretty excited about it. So we're riding down the ball game together, and um, his wife warned me. She said, don't, don't ask George about drywall. Like, well, that got me curious. Like, so I think I'll ask George about drywalling. Uh, so I did. Like, 
I didn't really know people could be excited about drywalling, but, but George was. And I don't know how much of the trip he talked about drywalling, but he talked about it a lot because he was excited about it. So uh, I talk about things I'm excited about. So um, one of the things I talk a lot about is uh, The Chosen, TV series uh, about Jesus and, uh, and, and the life of his disciples. Uh, I don't really like Jesus videos. I don't like Jesus movies. Uh, I love The Chosen. And so I talk about The Chosen. And, and when I was talking with a, 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 a newer couple in our church a few weeks ago, and it came out in the conversation that they, talk, that they watch The Chosen. And it's like, oh, really? You watch The Chosen? That's so great. And boom, I, I was off. Like I quit listening to them for a little bit because I just was so excited talking about The Chosen. I get excited about The Chosen. I get excited about The Bible Project. Anybody that I ever talk to uh, about the Bible in any way, shape, or form, I take every opportunity I can to say, you should really go to thebibleproject.com. You should really go to thebibleproject.com. Dot com. If you want to understand the Bible and learn about the Bible, uh, I would be remiss in saying that the person that talked to me about it was my daughter, Rachel, who uh, uh, insists that I forget often that she's the one that told me. So I like to talk about, I like to talk about the pirates. So one of the hard things uh, for me, no, I shouldn't say that, not a hard thing. Um, so like when, I get, when we have family gatherings on Lisa's side of the family, uh, not many of them, or, or maybe not any of them, are, are like really baseball fans or pirate fans. And like I could just latch onto that real quick if somebody would like just start talking about the pirates. Uh, I, w they won last night, did you know that? Uh, four to three. Uh, uh, ben Gamble hit a home run, a uh, two-run homer in the eighth inning to put them on top. Uh, so that's good stuff. Um, so we talk about what we get excited about. I'm excited about, I'm excited about Jesus. I'm excited about Jesus. You know, I, I watch a lot of things and I hear a lot of things about people walking away from the faith. People leaving the church. People leaving Christianity. And honest to goodness, every time I hear these stories, like the, the question I'm always wanting to ask is, did, did you know Jesus? Like, did, did you actually know Jesus? Because I just can't imagine walking away from knowing Jesus. So we talk about Jesus, if we know him. All right, here's the last thing. Talk about them, talk about Jesus, talk about you. You can talk about you. People might not actually mind listening to you tell your story. But it has to be your story. Like right away, we recognize people don't like to be preached at, right? And so you come for this every single Sunday to be preached at. I don't get it. People don't like to be preached at, but people do like to hear stories. So they, they might actually like to hear your story. Don't load it up with preaching. Just tell your story. So someone uh, did some kind of a poll. I can't uh, authoritatively uh, reference it. But 79% uh, of people agreed with this statement. If a friend really values their faith, I don't mind them talking about it. 79% of people agreed with that. Yeah, that's true. Like, if I have a friend and they really value their faith, I don't mind them talking about it. Now, I think, I think the key word in there is really values. Really values. Like, they would have to know that, that, that you're really serious about your faith. They would have to see that you're actually living out your faith. But yeah, 79% of people wouldn't mind hearing you talk about their, your faith if you really value it. Uh, a few years ago, uh, two or three or whatever. Um, we taught you how to share your faith in 15 seconds. Does anybody remember this? How to share your faith, how to share your story in 15 seconds. There was a time in my life when, then Jesus, now. So there was a time in my life when I lived with hidden guilt and shame. Then Jesus poured his mercy into me. Now I live 
peace, and confidence. Do you have a story like that? 15 seconds. Now, it might be that, that they hear you say that. There was a time in my life when I lived with hidden guilt and shame. And they might want to ask about that. Like, really, what, what was going on in your life then? Like, what kind of guilt did you have? What kind of shame did you feel? They might want to ask about that middle section, like, Jesus poured his mercy into you? Like, how, how did that happen? What did that look like? What do you mean by peace and confidence? So they might want to know more, but you can say it all in 15 seconds. There was a time in my life. This is just true. When I lived with hidden guilt and shame, Jesus overwhelmed me with his mercy. Now I live with peace and confidence. I think that's probably just 10 seconds. Or how about this? Um, I said one of the things I'm excited about is The Chosen. So uh, one of my favorite scenes, and, and I go back and I repeatedly watch. Uh, so I told you the three things I was excited about. You know, uh, Saturday, I was watching clips from The Chosen. No, wait. Friday, it doesn't matter. In the last three days, I've been watching clips from The Chosen, been watching clips from The Bible Project, uh, and tracking a pirate game. So, because you stay with things you're excited about. So, in this scene you're going to watch from The Chosen, um, uh, Nicodemus is questioning Mary Magdalene. Uh, Mary Magdalene has just had an encounter with Jesus uh, where um, uh, he, has, he has delivered her from what's afflicted her for most of her life. And Nicodemus wants to know how it happened because he thought he had something to do with it, but he didn't. So watch this, uh, watch this short clip um, and, and listen close for the end. Go, go ahead there, John. He called, he called me, Mary. Mary. He said, he said, I am his. I am his. I am redeemed. I am redeemed. And it was so. And it was so. Who, who did this? Did this? I don't know his name. I don't name. know his name. And even if I did, even if I did, I could not Why tell not? Him. Why not? It's time for men time to know, has not yet come. It's time, it's time for men. He performs, he performs miracles, miracles and no seeks no credit. Where, where, what does he look what like? Does he is look he like? a member, of, he Sanhedrin? member Sanhedrin? of Sanhedrin? Would you, would you, would you know him, him again? <laughs> I don't know why I am sharing this with you. I, I don't understand it myself. But here is what I can tell you. I was one way. And now I am completely different. And the thing that happened in between was him. So yes, I will know him for the rest of my life. <laughs> this is what I can tell you. I was one way. And now I am completely different. And the thing that happened in between was him. That's, that's, that's Mary's story. And you can see how engrossed Nicodemus is to hear her try to explain the change that's taken place in her life. So I wonder if you think you have anything worth talking about. Jesus saw the crowds, saw them. He compassion on them. For they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. 
So we are ones. This is the beauty of coming together. We come together as, as the flock of God. We all, like, we all like sheep. This is what the Bible says. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one wandered in our own way. That, that's everyone. And the shepherd found us. The shepherd found us. And instead of continuing to run the other direction, we allowed the shepherd to take us up and bring us back into the fold. Do you believe that God wants his lost sheep found? And do you believe that we participate in that? I, I, I do. I know the Bible speaks in these crazy mixed metaphors. Wait, are we talking about a harvest or are we talking about a sh flock of sheep? Right, because like, you just can't get it uh, in, in, in one single picture. But you can get it, and, and you can do it, because it's happened to us.